Let's start our next lecture. Our next speaker is Zhu He Yi from URUC. He will talk about the, the first lecture on high category theory. Uh, so I will start. Thank you for the introduction, Gordon. Uh, so the title for my talk, as it says uh, here, uh, is a one category theory of infinity categories. Um, so this is, this is my first ever uh, talk at IWAT and also first ever about infinity categories. So during the preparation for the talk, I got a lot of help uh, from various people. So let me first credit them before I forget. Um, so my, uh, my talk today and tomorrow uh, are gonna follow um, closely uh, the lecture notes written by my advisor, Charles Resk. So it's called an introduction to quality, cat quality categories and available here. So uh, he basically re re writes like um, writes this notes every time he teaches a course, which he, uh, teaches the higher category theory course at the math department of UIUC, and uh, which is about three or four semesters, uh, once every three or four semesters. So you should check back in from time to time. So he might have done a major upgrade since the last time you visited it. Uh, so I wouldn't know anything about the infinity categories without my letter Charles. So another major reference uh, for my talk is obviously private communications with him. Right. Um, so as Gordon mentioned, my talk is the first uh, on the higher category theory part of the summer school. So tomorrow, David Gartner is gonna give an opening talk that's supposed to uh, motivate why we care about infinity categorical uh, constructions. So I would like to thank him for uh, coordinating with me so that our talks don't, come, don't overlap too much and also for agreeing to uh, cover some of the more challenging topics underlying the, that technically underlie um, my talk. So that's a picture of the, the subject. So there are many structures underlying uh, the stuff you see. And during the talk, I also, uh, during my preparation for the talk, I also uh, got, uh, had very helpful conversations with Hannah. I was going to be uh, speaking about uh, infinity categories on day three and also Gordon. So I would also like to thank him for that. Right. Um, so, since my talk is the first about uh, higher categories, I'm going to do a mini introduction uh, so, uh, to motivate why we care about infinity categories. So, uh, in my talk, uh, when I use like this um, notation, infinity uh, hyphen, it will almost always mean infinity comma one. So let me briefly uh, say what this notation means without uh, going too much into the details. Oh, and Hannah's uh, posted link to my notes, uh, uh, which is now available on IWAT, uh, because like my the nature of my talk is that it contains a lot of uh, details, like. Uh, so it might be a little bit difficult for the audience to follow uh, that closely, say, if I talk too fast. So you can download the notes on IWAT here. Right. Uh, so to recap, I was going to uh, explain uh, this notation here. So um, in this um, notation, we have two parameters. So the idea about infinity category series that you allow your uh, morphism to have um, arbitrarily high dimensions. So the morphism we usually know in one category has dimension one. So objects kind of have dimension zero. Um, so um, in higher category theory, we allow when we write infinity here, we consider we allow morphisms of arbitrarily high dimensions. And then the second parameter says above which dimension uh, the morphisms are gonna be all invertible. So if I put one here, that means uh, morphisms of dimension two or higher are going to be invertible, right? But I'm not going to talk about any other, you know, uh, mm, categories. So it's just going to be infinity one category. So I'm going to abbreviate that, abbreviate that as infinity hyphen. So that's also a common abbreviation people use. So now to the question why we care about uh, infinity categories. So um, I put a sorry my. Falling out. So I put a quotation mark um, 
on this answer because that's my interpretation of the slogan people usually talk about. So the infinity categorical setting is the right place to do generalized homotopy theory using generalized topological spaces. So we, you'll notice that I've uh, covered some of the terminologies on this page. So if the two terms share the same cover, uh, that roughly means uh, they uh, correspond uh, to each other. So, right. so let me explain what I mean by, uh, by this answer. Right. So um, the re um, many times we care about in, in modern math, we care about sol solving a problem, but also uh, classify solutions to a problem up to some type of equivalences. So this type of structures are usually uh, organized in the form of a group point. So a category where every uh, morphism is an isomorphism. Right. So an example is, uh, say, um, if we have a topological space X, right, and we might wonder about uh, a sheaf on X valued in group points. So an example, for instance, would be uh, principal G bundles on X up to some type of equivalences. Right. So the idea is that, say, uh, for U and V open subsets of X, right, the sheaf has a value on V, has a value on U, and they both map to the um, uh, value of the sheaf on the intersection. Uh, we don't want this sheaf to be identical on the intersection, but only up to some type of equivalence or isomorphism. So that means we want the, uh, the value of the sheaf on the union of the two subsets to be a weak pullback in group points. So each of these uh, is a group point, and this is, a, this is only a weak uh, pullback, right? That means that to understand this sheaf, we need to understand uh, the category of group points because that's where these listing, right? And also uh, we, uh, we care about the homotopy theory of the, categories, the category of group points because that's what the weak kind of means. Right. So, and also uh, one caveat is that when, like, we can't really do homotopy theory without referring to the category itself. Right? You can't talk about the, like, the weak homotopy pullback without, you know, like, these group points. You don't understand these group, group points themselves. Right. So, uh, the, a general strategy we see in math is sometimes we, uh, to understand the concept, we make it more abstract. Right. So here, uh, an upgrade of the statement is the infinity category of infinity group points. Uh, so was there a question? I saw a raised hand or... No? Okay, um, right. So um, here, the infinity group points are supposed to be an upgrade of the one group point. And the, the infinity category is supposed to be an upgrade of the category and also uh, the homotopy category. So let me explain this two upgrades and why I say they are better. Um, right. So higher group points. Um, so if you allow your sheaf to value in high, higher group points, then uh, you will be able to solve problems about higher structures. Uh, so for instance, generalized cohomology. I think uh, Jacob Ray mentioned something like that in his talk. Um, and then something um, um, sort of a philosophy or slash theorem I want to mention, uh, originally due to growth, growth and things, is a homotopy hypothesis. Right. So it says for an, uh, any positive uh, integer or n equals infinity, you're supposed to have the correspondence between the collection of n group points and what, what's called the n truncated space. Right. Um, so I'm not going to and this is probably going to be a subject of, the, of later talks, so I'm not going to um, um, do all that. Um, most of you, since, you, since you're homotopy, you're homotopy series, know at least the n equals 1 case. Right. So for n equals 1, you can consider a group G as a one group point, which has one uh, object and also the um, morphisms given by the group element of G. So for G here, you can consider you can consider the classifying space, which we usually denote as BG here, right? So we claim, I claim that now that it's a one truncated space uh, because pi one of BG is uh, equivalent to G and also the higher homotopy group Spanish, right? So what's called a one truncated space. Right. So now uh, that's the higher group point, 
and why do we care about infinity categories? So notice that here, we're talking about a certain kind of homotopy lemma, right? So usually, like, if you've seen some of the model category theory, you know, uh, homotopy co-limits and limits are usually defined as they are derived, uh, as derived functors in equivalent model category. But uh, in the infinity categorical setting, those, uh, what you want to call the homotopy co-limits and limits are just honest uh, co-limits and limits. So uh, this is also an upgrade, upgrade. Right, so we don't want to necessarily stop here. So notice that here I have a sheaf that has values in uh, group point. So the generalization of that is going to be an infinity category of infinity sheaves value in group points. And that kind of corresponds to the statement here. Yeah, of course, I'm not going to be explaining you full detail what that is, but that's going to be, a, say, an advertisement for the later talks. Right. So now let's um, let me talk more specifically about what I'm going to talk about. So uh, on the previous page, I said I mentioned the word uh, infinity group point. So infinity group point is a particular kind. Uh, it's the same as the infinity zero category. So that has morphisms of arbitrarily high dimension and also morphisms uh, in positive dimensions are all invertible. Right? So in practice, we find that it's easier if we want to talk about the infinity category of infinity group points, just talking, it's easier just to talk about the infinity category of infinity one categories. It's a mouthful to say, right? Um, so there are uh, different models for infinity one categories. So the particular ones I will be using uh, are called quasi categories. So in my talk, I will uh, abbreviate that word by QCAT. Right? So that just is just a abbreviation of quasi category. So that's that's my talk. So understanding QCAT. So if you look at the uh, the list of glossary uh, here, uh, I write them down in this um, kind of ascending order. So this cat itself just means the one category of really small categories. That's what I'm going to consider. And then cat one, I'm going to talk about it briefly uh, in my talk today, um, the infinity category of small one categories. And then QPAD, uh, that's what I'm writing here. It's a one category of infinity categories. And these are going to be a, a full subcategory of the one category of what's called simplicial set to be defined sooner, uh, very soon. Um, and um, this is not really uh, part of my talk, but I assume David Gatner is going to talk about it. And also you're going to see it uh, uh, in Ali's talk and also I think in Phil's talk. So they're going to talk about specific constructions in the infinity category of infinity. So now that's why I titled my talk as the one category of infinity categories, because it's really about this one, right? building up to what this but that's not part of my talk. Right. Uh, so I think I said some of these here. So quality category really is just a model for the infinity categories, but it's a favorite model. So most people today, when they say infinity categories, they're thinking about quality categories. But there are situations where other models are uh, um, more convenient to use. Uh, so I believe David Gatner is going to cover some of them because uh, I don't feel that comfortable with them. Uh, so, right. Um, and in my talk, I will just use quality categories and infinity categories. You know, so at the beginning, I will remember to use uh, infinity categories more. Um, and then to remind you that I'm talking about infinity categories. And later, I will move on to talk about quality categories. I just refer to them as quality categories. So now let's start by defining uh, this category. So simplicial sets. So a simplicial set is just a pre sheaf uh, value in sets. So, but you're going to ask, what is this category? So, this is what's called a simplicial operator category. So, the objects in this delta uh, are going to be uh, totally ordered finite sets. So, bracket n has like n plus one elements, so from zero to n. And the morphisms in this category are going to, uh, we're going to refer to them as simplicial operators. So, these are just going to be monotone uh, functions going from, say, bracket n to bracket n. And then we give names for um, two specific types of uh, simplicial operators. So the first one are called uh, 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 phase operators. So I, I introduced them here mainly to talk about the notation. 
So, um, so a phase operator di uh, goes from uh, bracket n minus one to bracket n. So um, this notation means like it has like in the ice plate, what I put in the ice plate is the image of i. So here say in the zeros place, I put zero. That means this, this, morphism, this operator sends zero to zero. And then here up to i minus one, um, I still send i minus one to i minus one. But in the i spot, I would have put i here, but I'm leaving that out. So the i spot really is i plus one. So I send i to i plus one. So this is my notation. So in the end, I send a minus one to i. Right. So we also have degeneracy operators. So by this, this similar logic, but I'm adding one uh, in the middle. Right. So now simplicial set is just a perceived uh, on delta. Uh, value in set. Right? That's just the definition of a simplicial set. So I'm going to use the notation x sub n to denote the value of a simplicial set at bracket n. So this is uh, a particular set, right? So we're going to, I'm going to refer to this x n as a n cells or a synthesis in x, right? So I'm going to say a cell uh, in, in dimension m is degenerate if it's the image of some other cell under a non-injective simplicial operator. So you notice that I wrote it this way because that's the, uh, uh, that's the order you actually apply the two operations, right? So F sends, um, goes from bracket M to bracket N. So now if B is an N cell, so it goes from bracket N to some set. So now together, they go from bracket M to some set, right? So that's why A is, a, is an N cell. So now if a cell is not degenerate, I call it non-degenerate cell, right? So now you can show that the set of uh, degenerate N cells are uh, of this form, where you are a simplicial, it's the image of a simplicial uh, operator where the uh, codomain has smaller, uh, um, ha has smaller size than the domain. Um, Wait, uh, so the phase operator sends a minus one to n. So like, I don't know if I, I don't know if, uh, wait, I'm pretty sure like the terminology is right, but it goes from n minus one to n. Um, uh, is that? Uh, so there was comp there were comp complaints on the definition of phase operators and degeneracy operators. So let me try and fix that after the talk. Is kind of um, I can't can did I ask mix those? So let me fix that afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, geometrically right. that is yeah somehow obvious because the inclusion of a phase. Yeah. You represented by this di, which is the inclusion of a n minus one simplex to an n simplex. So that's uh, so I actually had the had the name swapped. Is that right? Yeah, because if it goes from uh, right, so because here it will have an cell going to a minus one cell, so probably it should be the other way around. No, 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 the really now thing is correct. So the phase operator corresponds to the inclusion of the phase. That's geometrically yeah. uh, an inclusion of a phase. And the yeah. phase operator uh, for a simplicial set, that's a, a contravariant functor. So that goes yeah. the other direction. Yeah, so it's supposed to be a, a minus. Uh, oh, I see. I probably had this wrong. Like the the the, the what I what I wrote the domain codomain wrong. I think. Right. Um, So is that, right, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so now uh, if we, uh, so now we can talk about the one category of simplicial sets. So uh, let me use this notation as set as the one category of simplicial sets. 
um, right? So um, here the objects are just simplicial sets and the more of them being natural transformations or functors, right? So things think of that are just functors. So in um, Jacob Ruiz Cardo, uh, this is denoted as set uh, lower delta. So now as, as you probably have guessed, uh, the simplicial set functor as the simplicial set has um, kind of a representing object. So um, they are the standard and synthesis. So uh, I'm gonna denote them by delta n and they're gonna be how, uh, the, the simplicial set that defined by evaluating a bracket n, right? So in particular, the m cells are just gonna be uh, the um, simplicial operators from bracket m to bracket n. So then uh, as we we're saying, there's a unit lemma uh, that says, right? So the, the, that's, well, the natural transformations between uh, from delta n to x is corresponds to the n cells right? given by evaluation uh, at the identity function uh, of um, uh, bracket n. The category of simplicial sets has initial objects, so that's the empty simplicial set that sends every bracket n to the empty set, and the terminal object uh, that's delta, uh, just delta naught, delta zero. Um, right, I think people are saying these are swapped, so. Let me try to fix that after the talk. I can't think about the controversy. I think phase is supposed to go from n minus one to n, so that's the right, right, but let me do it afterwards. Right. Um, so now uh, let, let me show you some pictures of the standard n simplex, right? So uh, the, uh, the zero simplex is just, just one vertex, right? Sorry, the zero syntax is just a, a, the zero uh, one vertex. And then the standard one syntax, you have uh, two vertices and an edge connecting them. So notice, uh, I should note that in this picture, I'm only drawing non-degenerate cells. Right. So the standard two syntax, I have uh, three edges and also the interior. So I'm gonna uh, write it off of there to say it's not, uh, the interior is not empty. And then this is uh, uh, a picture of uh, the standard three syntax. So that's a pyramid. Right. So I should say uh, the one category of simplicial, simplicial sets has small co-limits and limits. So, and they're computed degree-wise, but I'm not gonna uh, delve too much into them. So basically you have a formula for computing uh, co-limits of functor into the category of sets. Uh, and since uh, uh, simplicial sets are just a sheet valuing sets, uh, you, their co-limits and limits are just computed degree-wise. So let me now talk about what, uh, what a sub-object is uh, in the one category of simplicial sets. So a subcomplex A of X is just a sub -functor. So that means uh, uh, for the N cells, the inclusion is close under uh, the action of simplicial operators, right? So if we've seen what uh, a co-limit of simplicial set is, we can show that uh, uh, every subcomplex K of the standard n syntax is a co-limit uh, in simplicial sets. And also uh, you can identify the union of two simplicial sets as uh, a push out of simplicial sets along uh, their intersections. So this is the slides that I had on co-limits, but I probably won't have time to talk about it. So let me move on to the next topic. So uh, you might have wondered uh, what's the product and co-product of simplicial sets. So to define them, it's easy. Again, they're defined degree-wise. So the uh, n cells in the product is product of n cells, and uh, the co-pro, the n cells in co-product in co-product is the co-product of n cells. So uh, the usual product. Uh, home sets a junction that you prove that the product of simplicial sets is a simplicial set. And, uh, but the second one is slightly trickier. So this use, 
this uses what we call the connected components of a simplicial set. So oh. the, connected, the connected components uh, of X uh, we, it's a particular quotient of the thousand x. So, so we first collect all the thousand x. So that's that's what the notation means. And we're gonna define an equivalence relation by saying uh, an element in a cell uh, is uh, an n cell is equivalent to some other m cell if they are connected by a simplicial operator. So that's uh, um, the the equivalence relation here. So now uh, pi naught x. It's a set of all the uh, equivalence classes under this equivalence relation, and we're going to call them uh, the connected components. Right. It's not difficult to see that pi naught defines a, a, a function from simple sets to sets, and also it's monoidal with respect to the product. So you can also we also collect the fact that uh, each connected component is a subcomplex, and you can actually. Um, represent a simplicial set as the union of its connected components. Right. And also, uh, every standard and simplex is connected. So that means uh, the connected component is just a single term. Right. The set of connected components is just a single term. So use these facts, one can actually show that uh, any co of simplicial set is a simplicial set. So I do want to say one thing about uh, product of simplicial sets. So um, I'm going to use this one as an example. So I'm going to have two copies of uh, uh, delta ones. Right. So the the what I want to say here is that some, you might uh, uh, you might have a non-degenerate cell in this product that's made up from a degenerate cell in the first component. And a non-degenerate cell in the second component, and, and the other way around. So uh, here, you can actually show that uh, uh, the product of two uh, standard one synthesis uh, is a push out of two uh, standard two synthesis good along one common edge. So a more uh, intuitive picture is here, where uh, the entire thing is uh, delta one times cross delta one. And you have two, two, two cells. So A is one of them, B is the other. And so if we look at this edge, so they are glued along a middle edge. And if we look at this particular edge, we notice that uh, it's uh, non degenerate in the second component, right? It's just identity on delta one. But on the first component, right, it sends both ends of delta one to zero. So that's the non degen, uh, that's a degenerate cell here. But together, uh, they made up a non-degenerate cell in the product. So in in the lecture tomorrow, we're going to see that this is actually a co-limit in uh, infinity pool, not just in simple sets. Right. So now to talk about uh, infinity, uh, to talk about infinity categories, we need another type of uh, subcomplexes. Of, uh, we need we need to talk about a specific type of subcomplexes of the standard and syntax. So these are called the horns. So uh, the actual definition here can be a little bit difficult to read, uh, but I'm gonna use this one as uh, the definition for the horn. So I'm gonna read this as a horn up the, to the vertex J in the standard and syntax, right? So it is obtained by removing the only one non-degenerate N cell. So that's the largest non-degenerate N cell. And that's the only one uh, in here. And also the face, so that means a co-dimension, a co-dimensional one cell opposite to the vertex J. So same as the J here. So it's easier to look at the example. So we, if we start with the uh, uh, standard uh, one syntax, so it has an edge. So now uh, for the uh, horn opposite to zero, we delete the highest dimension, highest dimensional non-degenerate cell, and also the co-face, uh, the face. Of co-dimensional one, a cell of co-dimensional one that's opposite to uh, the vertex zero. So we delete this edge and also this vertex. So we're just left with zero. So similarly, the one opposite uh, to one is the uh, one uh, vertex here. Right. So uh, the standard two simplex looks like that. So we have a uh, the interior of the of the triangle is non-empty here. So um, maybe let's look at the middle horn. 
So the who are opposite to the vertex one is obtained by first deleting the imperial of the triangle. So, the, so that's a two dimensional cell. And also the uh, co dimension one cell. So that's the a one cell opposite uh, of the vertex one. So we're deleting alpha and also the sedge. So we arrive at this. So similarly, we can do the one opposite to the vertex, opposite of the vertex zero and opposite of the vertex two. Um, so this one is called the left, left one. Uh, well, let me just say here. So the one where J is smaller than N are called left ones. Uh, if, J are, uh, if J is positive, these are the right ones. And if J is strictly in between, they're in the horse. So this one is a inner horn. This one is a left horn. This one is a right horn. Of course, the inner horn is a, both a left horn and a right horn. And the reason uh, these are called, called the horns uh, is because probably the uh, three-dimensional picture. So yeah. the actual um, standard uh, three syntax is a solid pyramid, right? So now to obtain any uh, horn, uh, we look at, say, this is the vertex J. We remove the inner, uh, the interior of the pyramid, and also the face opposite to J. So you can imagine blow into this vertex and air coming out. So that's an actual horn. That's why this, these structures, these subcomplexes are called uh, are called horns. So now another construction uh, I want to talk about before uh, talk uh, before defining uh, infinity categories uh, is the nerve function. So the nerve, the nerve is supposed to be a functor that goes uh, from uh, the one category of small categories to the one category of simplicial sets. So the definition is given so that to say, if C is any ordinary category, uh, and C is supposed to be a simplicial set so that the N cells are the functors uh, between, uh, from the bracket N to C, right? So this is a Hom set. So, uh, the value of the nerve functor on an ordinary functor is just given by composition. So if you have an N cell uh, in nerve of C, you compose that with the functor F itself. You will get an N cell in D. Right. Indeed, nerve defines a functor uh, from the one category of categories to uh, that of the simplicial set. Right. An, obs an observation we want to make uh, is that um, uh, the Nerve uh, the nerve of bracket M is precisely the standard M syntax as spatial sets. So uh, to make this a little bit concrete, let me talk about the lower lowest dimensional cells in the nerve function. So the so the zero cells in uh, nerve of C are just the objects. Right? You send a zero, uh, you send zero to some C. So these are just the object uh, objects in C. So the uh, edges uh, in, in the nerve category uh, is just, well, in the nerve central set, uh, it's just some morphisms of the one category, right? And in particular, we have this um, um, simplicial operators giving uh, maps from morphisms to its source. So that's pre-composing with the simplicial uh, operator zero. And also from the uh, a morphism to its target. So that's uh, um, um, so that's given by the pre-composing with this one uh, simplicial operator. And also we have for each uh, object uh, in the nerve category uh, sent to the identity morphism on that object. Probably the most interesting is the two cells in the nerve of a category. So I claim that the two cells are in one one correspondence uh, with pairs of composable morphisms in C. So the function is given by, if you have a two cell uh, in the nerve of the category, so say here, it looks like that. So I've labeled the zero one edge of A as F and the one two edge as G. And we're saying it's, uh, it's in one one correspondence with composable morphisms. So the third, uh, the third edge are just, is just gonna be the, co the composition of the two uh, maps. So, and then the bijection sends A to these two uh, edges on the composable. Right. 
So since the nerve functor uh, goes from categories to simple neural sets, you might be wondering uh, which simple neural sets are uh, nerve of a category. Right? So we have a categorization, which is uh, similar to what we observe here uh, in dimension two. Uh, so a simple neural set is isomorphic to the nerve of some category if uh, for every dimension higher than two, uh, higher or equal to two, you have this bijection between the n cells in X uh, with a length n sequence of um, composable edges. So here, this notation, like G1 to Gn, they're all edges in X. Right? And then this, this equation means the, the target of the previous G is equal to the source of the next G. Uh, so we're saying this is a by, if this is a bijection, then the well uh, a simple set is a nerve. Uh, if this is a bijection, if and only if this is a bijection in every dimension. So another way of saying this proposition is that maps to nerves are determined by edges. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, building upon that, we have this important theorem that says the nerve function is actually a full is actually a fully physical embedding from the uh, from from the category of one category into the category of, of simple sets. So that is you have this bijection of home sets. So between functors between well, functors between C and D corresponds to uh, functors uh, between their nerves. So that's why we often uh, identify one category implicitly, we're identifying one category with your nerves uh, in simple in simple okay. So uh, let me say a little bit about the proof. Uh, so the details are on the next page, but I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna leave them out uh, here. Uh, so injectivity is clear because the function between categories are determined by the values, the injectivity of this are determined by their values on objects and morphisms. And subjectivity, if you have a, a functor G between the nerves, right, we're supposed to recover uh, what's the underlying functor uh, of ordinary categories. So G0 and G1 already gives the value of that underlying ordinary functor on objects and morphisms. And then the composition of, for that functor uh, is unique basically by this proposition. So that's it. So now we can uh, actually define uh, an infinity category or quad category. So a simplicial set C is called uh, an infinity category or quad category if it has the inner horn extension property. So here uh, the lambda and j is supposed to be a inner horn. So here j is between zero and n, but not equal. So it's a subcomplex of the standard the standard n simplex, right? So if any map uh, out of the inner horn extends uh, to the standard n simplex, we say the simplicial set C is a quality category or infinity category. So notice that I didn't say the, um, the, the extension is unique. So you might be wondering why, uh, when is, a, is such an extension unique? That's precisely this proposition. So a simplicial set X uh, is isomorphic to the nerve of some ca ordinary category if only if it has a unique you know, horn extension. So uh, this extension here is unique. Right? So in other words, right, you have the N cells. So this is the Yoneda lemma, Yoneda lemma here. So you have the N cells uh, mapping, well, bijectively uh, to the uh, uh, functors from the inner horn to X, functors from inner horn to X. So what we actually saw is that nerve defines a functor from like previously we defined nerve as a, a priori, we define nerve as a functor from cat to SF, right? But we've just seen that it actually factors through the full subcategory of the one category of quality categories. So uh, this sort of this proposition and also the theorem we saw before uh, is what people what justifies people saying, let C be an infinity category, which is a category. So what they really, really mean is that C is an infinity category that's isomorphic to the nerve of some ordinary category. 
And also an important thing to notice that since here the uh, inner core extension is not necessarily unique, uh, um, that kind of suggests that composition in the infinity category uh, might not be, we might not be able to define them the, the same way we, we had for one category. So I'm gonna continue using the convention I've been using for CP set. So the objects are gonna be the zero cells, the morphisms are gonna be the one cells, and we have these um, uh, operations I mentioned previously. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about the detailed proof of this proposition, but it's here. Right, so let me define some of the basic concept that you uh, my hope holds for infinity uh, that can be defined for infinity categories. So uh, for any ordinary category, you can define its opposite category. So objects are the same, morphisms go the other way. So uh, that means you can do, do uh, the opposite category for simply for set, right? And in particular, uh, you have this identification uh, of for the opposite category of the standard and syntax and also uh, with itself and also the opposite of the horse. So this would also mean that uh, this opposite category construction translate to infinity categories. And also it plays well with yours. So I've, I've already talked about this implicitly. So when I say uh, the Q cat is supposed to denote uh, the, the, full sub, the full subcategory of simple set spent by uh, infinity categories, I already kind of in, uh, implied this. So functors between simplicial, uh, uh, functors between infinity categories are just functors between simplicial sets. And then you also define nitro transformations uh, the way you, you, you would expect, right? So we say H is a natural transformation from F0 to F1, uh, where F0 and F1 are uh, functors of quality categories from C to D. Uh, if H is a map of simplicial sets from C cross delta one, so this is a simplicial set because it's, because we showed product of simplicial sets. Uh, it's a simplicial set. So H is the map of simplicial set from C cross delta one to D, where uh, it re restricts to Fi on either end of this delta one. So another important thing uh, to note, is we can define a subcategory of infinity categories. So we really mean sub infinity categories, but that would be an awkward terminology. So we just, I would just call them subcategories of infinity categories. So it should be a subcomplex. So a subcomplex C prime is a subcategory, uh, well, a subcomplex C prime in C uh, is gonna be a subcategory of C if for any dimension higher than higher or equal to two and any inner horn. If a cell uh, that's in C has a horn contained in C prime, then the cell is actually in C, uh, in C prime. So if a cell that was a priori in C has any restricted to any inner horn is in the subcomplex, it also implies that the, the cell is actually in C prime, then that subcomplex is a quasi category. Uh, uh, it's a subcategory of infinite car categories. So you will be able to do the you know, whole extension in the C prime. So it's a, a subcategory, it's a full subcategory as you probably have uh, predicted. If any N cell in that subcategory has all the verte vertices, well, if it's a if only if. So a cell in C, an, an cell in C is an cell in C prime, if and only if all its vertices are in the uh, subcategory C prime. Right. A warning, uh, which I'm gonna explain later, uh, well, very soon, is that uh, if C prime and C are actually two uh, infinity categories, uh, but C prime is only contained in C as a subcomplex, so that, that that's a subcomputer by definition, C prime will not be a subcategory uh, of C as infinity categories. So you might not have this condition just because it's a subcomplex and C prime itself is a quality category. Right. So as an example, the warning 
I'm going to talk about the, um, the infinity category of small one categories. So that's the spawning notation uh, cat lower one. Right? Uh, so like this, this exact definition uh, of the n cells in cat one is a little bit difficult to parse. But let me say the zero cells in this cat one are going to be small cat, ordinary categories. Right? We're talking about the infinity category of small uh, ordinary categories. So the one cells are going to be functors between categories. And then the two cells notice are going to be the natural isomorphisms between uh, a functor to uh, uh, a composite of two composable functors. Uh, composite, right, composable functors. So uh, also note, right, so that's what kind of was said here. Uh, and also notice that if you have a, a function and you compose a function with uh, an, an identity uh, function, the natural isomorphism is actually required to be identity. So it's kind of like we don't want to introduce any more information in dimension three and above. The only like more information we're introducing is the natural isomorphisms on, at dimension two. Okay. And then we also require uh, uh, basically a strict a strict associativity. So here we want this uh, composition to be to commute on the nodes, not commute up to you know, natural isomorphisms. So I've marked the screen because uh, I'm going to explain what they mean later uh, on the slide. Right. So as I as I claimed, what I've just defined is the infinity category. So I'm supposed to use the definition of the infinity category of an infinity category to show that this is an honest infinity category. So I'm going to start with the uh, inner core at dimension two. So that's the only inner core you have. So that means you have a uh, uh, two compos composable functors, right? From C naught to C one and from C one to C two. Right. So we are asking if we can extend this to a two cell in cat one. Right. Indeed, we can. We can just take the third cell, a uh, third edge, to be the composition of the two edges, and then the 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 two cell to be the identity natural transformation. But of course, the feeder, like the extension we just uh, filled in, uh, need not be unique, right? Because that's a definition. That's a construction for cat one. We allow all natural isomorphisms to fill in this uh, two cell here. So what I want to say here uh, is that uh, the extension in dimension three or higher are, are these extensions are actually unique. So basically, because we require strict um, identity and strict associativity here. So the basically what I'm trying to say is that dimension two is the only place where things go wrong. So what I meant by go wrong is that. The, if you take the nerve of the ordinary category of categories, it's only isomorphic as a subcomplex of this infinity category of non categories. So where uh, you can, where it contains a cell, that's uh, the, where the composition is unique. It's that identity instead of natural isomorphism. And the nerve of the one category is not a subcategory of cat one. So we now have a subcomplex between uh, of infinity categories, right? This is a nerve, so it's an infinity category, uh, but it's not included as a subcategory, right? Since basically because of this, right? we have many natural isomorphisms we give that are not uh, identity natural transformation. Okay, so now let me, well, uh, so let's recall what we said about the nerve. So we said a nerve is a full face, full face, Faithful embedding uh, from the one category of cat, the one category, of, one category of ordinary categories into uh, the category of uh, infinity categories. So you might uh, ask, is nerve part of an adjunction? And the answer is yes. And the other part of the adjunction is an important construction, uh, which we call the fundamental category. So for any simplicial set, the fundamental category is an ordinary category with the universal mapping property. So it has a universal mapping property for mapping into nerves. Right? So that means right, you have a map from X to the nerve of the fundamental category of X so that the induced um, uh, 
function on home sets uh, into a nerve of some category C uh, induces a bijection. Right. So it's a proposition that every serial set has a fundamental category. And so you have this adjunction. So the taking fundamental category is a left adjoint to taking nerve. So you might be asking, why am I using the H here? Because H seems seems to be standing for homotopy category. So uh, I'm making this extinction because uh, you can define fundamental category for a simplicial set, but we're only going to talk about uh, fundamental category for infinity categories. Right? So that's what I'm doing now. Right. So to talk about fundamental, uh, to talk about a fundamental category of an infinity category, let me first define an equivalence relation. So I'm going to read this as left homotopy and right homotopy on a home set in, um, in a quasi category. So it's probably better to look at the picture. So here I say an edge F is left homotopic to G if they're connected on the left uh, by, an ident by an identity morphism. Right? So, and they make up uh, a two cell in C. Analogously, we say uh, F is right homotopy to G if they're uh, connected on the right by an identity um, um, morphism in C, and also they uh, represent a true cell in C. Right. So now you have, uh, I think, reflexive, reflexive uh, So G is left homotopy and right homotopy to itself. And you also have the equivalence between uh, left homotopy and right homotopy. So it's actually an easy application of the you know, horn extension property. So here I'm drawing a you know, you know, horn of the standard three simplex up the, to the vertex one. So that's this vertex one here. So zero, one, plus two, three. So this, this two cell here it's, uh, exhibits this relation F is left homotopy to G. This two cell here, it's uh, fact that G is left homotopy to itself, yellow being G being right homotopy to itself. So together they made up uh, of this inner core. And since C is an infinity category, we know it, it extends to the full uh, standard three syntax. So now the face we're looking at gives the fact that F is right homotopy to G. Okay, so now that's when we fill in is an honest uh, choosing. To so now we've shown uh, by a similar argument, you can show uh, the left homotopy and right homotopy are transparent. So now we've shown that these two relations are actually equivalent to each other, and they define an equivalence relation for each of the half sets. Right. So now we're ready to define what it means uh, uh, to be a homotopy to be the homotopy category of an infinity category. So that's uh, that's a category where the objects are the same as the objects in the uh, are same as the zero cells in the quasi category, and also the morphism sets are given by the quotient of the original home sets by that equivalence relation. And then you can uh, define the right. So you, right, notice that I said about composition might not be that straightforward in the infinity category. But in its homotopy category, you can just define the uh, com composite to be the equivalence class of any of the actual composite of GNF. So any of the maps in the in the equivalence um, in the equivalence class of G composed with F is a composition of GNF. So that's actually an if and only if. That's what I'm writing here. So now rem recall what I said about the fundamental category. So what I want to uh, say right here is that the explicit construction we just give uh, for homotopy category of an infinity category is actually a fundamental category uh, for this infinity category as a simplicial set. So we have this functor from C to N of HC, that's identity on uh, objects, and also sending uh, any edge f here to the equivalence class of f in uh, in the nerve of the homotopy category. Right. So you can actually show that this uh, this map makes an uh, uh, what we just defined 
uh, the homotopy category into a fundamental category. So it has a universal property. And so now we've arrived at an injunction between infinity categories and uh, the one category of categories. I probably should say this is QCAT. Yeah. I change the notation midway when I prepare the talk. Right. So now um, something stronger is true. So um, I claim that we have actually we we actually have a bijective correspondence between uh, the subcategory of an infinity category and the subcategory of the uh, homotopy category of C. So everything here is an ordinary category. Everything here is an infinity category. So one direction is obvious. This direction, so it's just if uh, two edges are homotopic, one of them being uh, in one of them being in uh, a subcategory implies the other. It's also in the subcategory. So you have a well-defined functor. So H is a well-defined functor. Right. And then to go the other way, uh, what I, I, I don't think I have time for that. So let me just save it here. So basically, you construct this. So given, let's see, given a subcategory, a subcategory D prime of the homotopy category, you form the pullback D tilde along the pi and also the nerve applied to this inclusion. And this, we claim this pullback in sequential set is actually uh, the, uh, gives you the backward uh, direction of this back direction. Right, so now uh, we can finally define, uh, define count complexes. So to do that, let me first define what it means to be an equivalence uh, in an infinity category. So we say an edge, so for C, any infinity category, an edge uh, is an equivalence or isomorphism, some people use, uh, is if its image in the homotopy category is actually an isomorphism. So this is an ordinary category, right? So you can speak about isomorphism in here, right? So in other words, it's just that there's an inverse uh, of this F in the homotopy category, right? And we actually call G the inverse of F. And obviously uh, the inverse is not unique, right? So because that's in the homotopy category, but it's defined unique up to homotopy, right? And you can show that a function of infinity category sends equivalences to equivalences. Right, so now we are finally ready to uh, define count complexes and infinity group points. Right. Remember, one of them is supposed to be uh, the one side of the homotopy hypothesis. Right. So a count complex, recall that we said a uh, simplicial set is an infinity category if it has uh, extension property for inner ones. So now uh, an infinity category is a count complex if it has extension property for all ones. So you do, we no longer re require the state to be uh, strictly between zero and one. Right. Uh, well, it's not, we no, we no longer require. So a count complex has to satisfy extension property for all the ones, not just the unit ones. Okay. So now uh, we define an infinity group point to be an infinity category whose homotopy category is actually an ordinary group point. Right. So that's uh, an infinity category where every morphism is an equivalence. Right. So since I mentioned the homotopy, well, since I mentioned homotopy hypothesis, one side of the homotopy hypothesis in this model of quality categories for infinity categories is actually quite easy. So that's every count complex is an infinity group. So if you take any edge in, in the count complex X, right, since this is a count complex, it has all inner horn extension. So in particular for this uh, horn, uh, left horn uh, in the standard syntax, the standard two syntax, you have the extension. So that means we've produced where, where the third edge is the identity of X. So that means we've produced a, a post inverse of F, right? At where the inverse is defined up to homotopy. Right? So you can repeat the same argument for every edge, then you show every edge has a post inverse. And like the standard trick shows that every uh, um, every morphism in in the count complex K and uh, is an equivalence. So that is K is an infinity group point. So we prove that every count complex is an infinity group point. 
So the idea, the big theorem is that the converse also holds. So that's going to be uh, what I'm, that's going to be an advertisement for uh, my lecture tomorrow. So I'm going to talk about that. So right now it's 10.59, so I, I don't know if I should continue, but I can stop here. Great. So thank you for listening.